Okay, so let's start. So good, good afternoon, everybody. So last time, <clears throat> last time I told you in this course, we are gonna use binary, hexadecimal and decimal. And I told you the reason because as you would see in, in this course, everything is this, this computer or this microchip is only, is, can only work, work on binary numbers, okay? As you will see, all numbers are binary, instructions are binary, everything is binary, okay? That's why we need to learn the binary number. This meant for us, for humans, that's what we use in our life, okay? However, we also need hexadecimal simply because it's just more convenient for me if I want to give you a binary number, it's better to tell you 3A instead of telling you 0, 0, 1, 1, 0, 1, that's it. So it's just, it's just, it's a shorter representation of the binary number, it's just more convenient for us. That's, it. that's why in this course, if I tell you this memory location is storing the number 3A, actually it's not storing it in 3A, it is storing 0, 0, 1, 1, 1, 0, 1, 0. It has to be binary, right? However, it's easy for me to, to give it to you in, in, in hexadecimal, okay? Anyway, uh, this, this is why we need hexadecimal. I also explain how can you convert hexadecimal to binary, binary to hexadecimal, which is very trivial, very easy, because in hexadecimal, we have numbers from zero, we have digit to nine, and then after that, we have A, we have B until F. Right? So every digit here can be represented by four bits. For example, zero means zero, zero, zero. One, one is one, zero, zero. So it's gonna go all the way until one, 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 okay? So this all the, uh, that's why it's very easy. All what I told you guys, if I give you a hexadecimal number like this one, all, all what you have to do, very simple. All what you have to do, just to remove every digit by the four. So this one is gonna, I'm gonna replace this one by, by its, it's four bits, that's it. This one by four bits, that's it, okay? Same thing when you convert the binary to hexadecimal. You have to make groups of four, right to left, group of four. And then you have to replace every four bits by the corresponding digit, okay? Also, we agreed, we agreed. I can't, I can't just give you a number without telling you which system is it, because it's gonna be confusing. That's why in this course, if you mean this number is hexadecimal, you have to put do dollar sign. Let's agree on this, okay? If I put percent, that means this number is binary. If I put nothing here, that means this number is decimal. Is that okay, guys? I have I have to do that because one zero can mean it, it's hard, as a, in this example, it can it can mean two, it can mean sixteen, it can mean ten, right? It depends on the system. So you have to tell me which system you are using, okay? Uh, also, last time I explained how can you convert the binary numbers to, to decimal. I told you, if the number is unsigned, that's just a very easy, straightforward way. All what you have to do, you have to multiply the digit, every digit by the weight, and then add everything together. One times the weight, one times the weight, one times the weight, and so on. Add everything together. However, if the number is signed, okay? Sign again means it can, can be positive, zero, or negative. If the number is signed, so now there are two cases, okay? If the most significant bit, and also let's agree on this, okay? So from now on, from now on, if you have a byte or a word, it doesn't matter. If you have a byte or word, whatever, whatever, whatever the size is, the first bit here on the right, we call it least significant bit, least LSP, okay? Because you can even, it's very easy, just from the English name, because this one has the least, least weight, two to the power zero. However, the last one here, which is two to seven, this one should be the most significant bit because this one has the highest significant, uh, the highest weight. In case of 16 bits, for example, if my information or my data is 16 bits, so this bit, bit number zero, bit number one, bit number two, bit number three, all the way until bit number 15, 16 bit, right? This is a word, 16 bit. So this bit here, this is the most significant bit. This one here is the least significant bit. Is that okay, guys? So, you, so now we, we, let's agree on this, okay? So from now on, when I say least significant bit, you should know what this means. When I say most significant bit, you should know what this means. Also, byte 
means it bits. So if your information or your data is a, is you, you store it in a pipe, that means it's going to be stored in eight bits. Okay, so your data can you can store it in a byte, you can store it in a word or double word. It's up to you. You can control the size. You got what I'm saying? Based on what? Based on how big the number you are expecting, because byte has a limit, as I'm going to explain right now. If if you if for example if you are if you, if you have a small number, I'm expecting the small number. Okay, byte may be enough. If your number is bigger, okay, so you have to put it in a word and so on. Okay, I'm going to give you more details. So for now, for most of the time in this course, we're gonna use bytes or words. Byte means eight bits, words means 16 bits. Okay, so that means eight bits, this is one information, one, one, one data, like for example, velocity, temperature, speed, whatever it is, okay? It's stored in just speaks, how big is the speaks, okay? Anyway, also, if you have a word, if you have a word, the word is actually, every word is two, two bytes or every word, so eight bits and eight bits. That's why the first bit here, the, sorry, the first byte here, we call it least significant byte. The other byte, we call it most significant byte. You understand what I'm saying? So byte and byte. This is can make a word. This one, least significant byte, most significant byte. Is that okay? Easy, okay. Uh, but just let's we, we, let's agree on this. So in the future, when I say least significant byte, you should know what, what, what this means, okay? Uh, so I said last time, if your number is signed, and signed means that your number can be positive, zero, can be negative. Okay, in case of unsigned, so positive or zero, right? And when you write your program, you are the one who should decide if your data signed or unsigned. Makes sense, right? For example, if I want to count number of students, number of cars, number of whatever, okay, I count the number. Should I select signed or unsigned? It doesn't make sense. The number of students or cars is negative number. It doesn't make sense. So it has to be unsigned. Okay. So based on what you are measuring, right? If I measure the temperature, the temperature can be positive or can be negative. So I can use sign. So it's up to you. Uh, so it's, okay. So in case in case your number is signed, so now there are two cases. If the most significant bit is zero, so that means the number is positive. If the most significant bit is one, that means this number is negative, negative number. Is that okay? So now, how can you convert this binary to this one? Okay, number one, if the number is positive number, so the way you are gonna convert it similar to this one, you have to multiply every bit by, by the weight. Okay, for example, I'm giving you an example. If you have one, 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 zero, 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 this way, okay? If this is a number, this is a byte, right? So it should be, I have to multiply two to, two to zero times one, two to one, two to two, two to three. And then this is zeros, right? So she should be 15. So the way I'm gonna do this one is similar to this one, okay? But if the number is negative, if this number is negative, okay? How I can convert it to decimal? There are different ways. Maybe you have already learned it another way. I'm totally fine, I'm totally fine. But the way I'm explaining it here is, you should understand also, what I mean by two's complement, okay? And this is what I'm gonna do in the quiz, not, not this, uh, I'm not gonna quiz you uh, this uh, Thursday, but next week, okay? So I'm gonna ask you in the quiz. I just wanna make sure you understand what, what uh, if I give you a number, can you calculate the one's complement? Can you calculate the two's complement or not? Very easy. For example, here, uh, that's what I'm saying here. I have this number. When I tell you calculate the one's complement, very trivial. All what you have to do, just to flip the bits. One should be zero, zero, one, zero, one, zero, just to flip the bits, that's it. So, the, so if this is a number, this is the one's complement of this number. Is that okay? If I add one, if I add one to this number, I'm gonna get what we call the two's complement, okay? So the two's complement is the one's complement plus one, plus number one, okay? So that's what I did here. So for example, I have this number here. I wanna calculate the two's complement of this number. Again, maybe you already have learned it. How can you calculate the two complement in a different way? That's totally fine, okay? But uh, I'm explaining this way, okay? So here, number one, the first step, I'm gonna do the one's complement first. How? I'm gonna flip the bits, this number one. Number two, I'm gonna add number one. So I'm gonna get this one. So this number is the two complement of this number. Or this number is the two complement of this number. So listen to me. So if I calculate the two complement of this number, I'm gonna get this one. If I calculate the two sum of this one, I'm gonna get this one. Is that okay? So now, now you should, you already, you have learned how can you calculate the two sum? 
and the ones component. If I give you any number, you should be able to calculate the ones component and the two component. Okay. Now, now, what is the meaning of two component? What it means? Okay. The two component is this is the approach we are using to represent the negative numbers. The negative numbers. Is that okay? For example, what this number is? This number is number one. One zero zero zero. It's number one, right? So the two component of this number should be negative one. Is that okay? So this is so two component similar. You are multiplying by minus one. So that's why in the coming quiz, I'm gonna ask you. Okay, give me the binary number of eleven. Uh, sorry, negative eleven. Okay, in binary. Again, there are different ways to do it, but the, the simple way to do it, in my opinion, is number one, get positive 11. Okay. Positive 11 is easy, right? Because this is eight, eight, and uh, eight, and uh, uh, two, right? And one. And then I'm going to put zero here because it is stored in a pile. I know some, some of you are confused why you put zero here on the left. Again, because I'm not, I'm not looking at it. At, at, at it as a number. I'm looking at it as a pile. So if, you, if, if it is physically stored in, in, in a pile, so there should be something here, okay? Because this is a hardware, so there should be zeros here. Okay? Anyway, so, so this is positive 11. Okay, guys, this is positive 11. Now, uh, if I calculate the two complement of this one, I'm going to get negative 11. Is that okay? So if you calculate the two score, number one, I'm going to calculate the one's complement, zero, zero, one, zero, one, 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 one. And then I'm going to add one plus one. So it should be one, zero, one, zero, one, one, one. So this one should be negative 11. Is that okay, guys? So what the way, if you have, if you know the number is negative, okay? So how can you, if I give you a negative number, how can you calculate the decimal value, okay? There are different ways, but the, in my opinion, the easy way, my opinion is just to get the positive version of this number. How calculate the two scumbling? So if I give you uh, a, a negative number, calculate the two scumbling. Now you have a positive number. Once you have a positive number, you can, you can get it two to zero, two to one, two to two e easily. For example, let me give you an example. If you have this number, look here, guys. Two cases. First case, I tell you this number is unsigned. Okay, and you know, unsigned is easy. Should be two to zero plus two to one plus two to two all the way until two to seven, which is equal to two fifty five. Yeah, that's very easy one, right? If I tell you this number is signed. Okay, now I'm gonna look at this one. So for sure this is a negative number. For sure this is a negative number. Okay, so I'm gonna calculate the two complement to get the positive version of this number. So if I calculate the two component of this one, it should be one, zero, 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 zero. Okay, that means this is, this is positive one. That means this one should be negative one. Okay, guys. So also I have a very nice, if, if, you, I go, if you go to the slides of this chapter, I have a very nice figure here. Yeah, if you look, if you look at this figure, guys, here, uh, yeah, so we have three bits. This all the numbers, possible numbers for three bits. Here is a, here I give you, I give you this number if it is unsigned or signed. So for the, for example, this number zero, zero, 001, okay? If this number is unsigned, should be one. Signed should be one, one and one, okay? If this number is signed or unsigned, two and two, three and three, zero, this one is zero, zero or zero. Signed or unsigned, the same, okay? However, so look at this part from here to here, guys. So this part is the positive number part, okay? This number is a positive. So in case positive number, signed or unsigned is not gonna make difference. It's the same number, right? If it's here two, two, three, three, if it's the number is positive. Here, this part should be start as a negative number. Here in the negative number, for example, one, 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 here, it can be seven if this number is unsigned, and if the number is signed, should be negative one. This one, six, and negative two, unsigned six, uh, signed should be negative two. 
this one five or, or, or negative three, okay, and so on. This just by accident, they are the same, a four and negative four, just by accident, anyway. Okay, guys? Okay, now, so I'm expecting now from you guys, you should, if I give you a number, if I tell you, if I tell you, if I tell you this number signed or unsigned, you should be able to convert the binary to decimal, okay? Okay. Um, okay. Now, the very the important question now. Listen to me, guys. And I know it's a little bit. You are gonna get confused a little bit until until I teach you more in this course in, in this point. Okay. The question is. Look here. If I have one 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 one. Okay. So. This, this binary number, it can be 255 if this number is unsigned, or it can be negative one if this number is signed. It can have one of two values, right? So you should ask me, how can I know? Okay, how I can know if this one is signed or unsigned? I told you before, if the number is unsigned, uh, sorry, if the number is signed, I can know if it's positive or negative or the most significant can be here, right? So the question, how, how, I, how I can know? Just give me one second. Just one second. Okay, how, how I can know signed or unsigned? Okay, is there one bit here I can look at it to know signed or unsigned? The answer is no. Okay, so what happens is that, guys, and listen to me, what happens is that this is something you have to consider when you write your own program from the very beginning. You got what I'm saying? Oh, so when you write your own program, you already from the beginning, you should decide. This number signed or unsigned, and then you have to build your program based on that. Okay, that's why later in this course, when I teach more in this course, uh, for example, when I teach multiplication instruction in assembly, multiplication, I'm gonna give you two set of instructions. Some instructions that can do multiplication for signed numbers, others can do it for unsigned numbers. Okay, the, so. You, you are the programmer when you program when, when you write your code when you write your program you already decide in the very beginning the sign or unsigned okay and then if this and then you have to use the correct instruction for signed or unsigned so, okay so this is one one thing the other thing also guys here look here um if i have a number like this one and i want to display to the user so here i i got this number from somewhere and i want to display to the user here is that on the LCD, right? So I have to write a program to convert this number from binary to decimal because humans, human can only understand decimal, okay? So that means, that means I should have two different programs, okay? One program for sign, the other one for unsigned. You got what I'm saying? So, so that if this number is unsigned, I have to display 255. If this number is signed, I have to display negative one. This is also something you have to consider when you write your own program. Okay. Okay, guys. So what I'm saying, I don't want to could be get you are gonna understand better when you go through this course, but do your best to understand what I'm saying here. What I'm saying here, uh, if the number is signed or unsigned is something you have to consider when you write your own uh, program. Okay, so that means. One, 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 it can mean negative one or it can mean 255, okay? So as I'm gonna explain later, when you do multiplication, when you, when you compare, if I wanna compare to this number to another number, right? So I have to, it's gonna be different, signed or unsigned. For example, if I wanna compare this number to one, zero, 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 zero. So this number is positive one, okay? So that means, if you consider this number unsigned, so this number is greater than this number. If you consider this number signed, so this number is greater than this number. You understand what I'm saying, guys? That's why when I teach when I teach you instruction for comparison, I'm gonna give you two sets of instructions, one for signed and one for unsigned. And then 
you know when you when you write your program, you know this sign or sign. So you have to use this instruction or that instruction. Okay. So anyway, what I'm saying, sign or unsigned is something you have to consider when you build your own uh, program. The microcontroller, the microcontroller, the hardware doesn't know if signed or unsigned. Okay. That is why the hardware is going to give you two sets of instructions. One to do multiplication if your number are assigned. One to do multiplication or comparison if your numbers uh, are assigned. And when you write your program, you have to consider. You have to consider. Sorry, you have a question now? So that second number, you're saying it's not the least complement? Uh, this one? The one you said was negative one. Yes. So yeah, this number is negative one. You are asking me how how did you do this conversion? How I converted to negative one? No, I'm just asking why we would we not do once complement? Why? Why it's not once complement? Yeah. Okay. Look to my answer. My answer to represent is a negative numbers in binary. There are different approaches. Okay. One of the approaches very widely used is the two complement, not not the one complement. Okay, why? I'm gonna explain later because it's it. Um, there are other approaches to 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 create negative numbers, but the people like the two complement approach because, as I'm gonna explain later, it doesn't need new hardware. It's still, what you are doing here, you you can just it's addition. Still, you can use addition to do both of them. Okay, for, for example. Let me explain it quickly. For example, here, if I add, if I want to do subtraction A uh, or here A, take away B, okay? So this subtraction, uh, okay, let me explain here. So the sub subtraction operation is actually addition. So I'm gonna add A plus B, B prime plus one. That's why the people like, because this negative B, negative B is actually B prime plus one. Anyway, anyway, so this is, I'm gonna explain it later. You will see it later, but the good thing here about, the good thing about the two, the two complement is you can use addition to do two things, addition and subtraction. I don't need new circuit because subtraction, subtraction is actually addition to the two complement. You get what I'm saying? So if I wanna do this operation, A take away B, I can do this way, A plus B prime plus one. So I can do subtraction using, I can do addition using subtraction. Is that okay? One more thing you should consider. Your question is, why, why I don't use one complement? Okay, simply because it's not gonna work. Okay, what, what you mean it doesn't work? I'm gonna tell you what, what it means. For example, if you have a positive, positive one and negative one, what should be the result? Zero. Okay, if, if, if you do it using two complements, it's gonna work. If, what if this positive four, negative one, if you add them together, Binary, so here I'm gonna get positive three. If you use two commands, it's not gonna work. It's not gonna get positive three because one comment cannot cannot represent binary numbers in negative, right? But it has to be the two commands. Anyway, okay, guys. Okay. Any questions? Any questions? So now, in the coming quiz, if I give you a number and ask you to convert it to binary, it should be easy, right? If I give you a number and ask you to calculate the one scum, the two scum, it should be easy. Is that okay? Now, this is just very easy. You know, if you have a decimal number, how can you convert it to binary? You know, you know the idea when you divide by two. So nine divided by two is four, and the remainder is one, right? Because two, two times four is eight. Right, so there is a remainder one. Four divided by two is two, and the remainder is zero. Two divided by two is one, and the remainder is zero. One divided by two is zero, and the remainder is one. You, you, you know this one. This is how can you, this is how can you convert the uh, decimal, uh, decimal to binary. One more thing, if it's a small number, you don't need to do this one because, for example, I know the first, the weight of the first bit is one, two, four, eight. So for example, and then 16, right? 32, uh, 64, 128. This is the weight for each bit. Okay, guys? 
which is two to zero, two to one, two to two, two to three. Okay. For example, I want to make one twenty eight. Okay, so I'm gonna put here one zero zero zero. I can do this way. Okay, maybe easy way. Ten. If I wanted to ten, so here it has to be one here and one here to make ten. Okay. Or you can just use this one when you divide by by two. Anyway. Any question? Okay. Now, if you have input num number, if you have number and this number has inputs. In bits number, okay. So whatever n is, n can be eight bits, sixteen, whatever n. Okay. So you have in bit number. Okay. So how many, how many different combination you can have here? What I mean by combination is, if you have all the possible number from zero 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 until one one one, how many total combination you can have for in bit number? The answer is two to n, two to the power n. Okay, guys. Let's say it again. If I have n bit number, a number, this number is n bits, how many different combinations I can have? Combination means zero, zero, one, zero, different combination. Is that okay? Should, should be two to the power n. Let me give you an example. Example. If I have three bit number, three bit, so how many combinations I have for three bit? Should be zero, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. So this is all the combination I have. How many? Two to the power three, which is eight. Make sense? So, so you should you should know this one. Okay. So now if, if we have eight bits, eight bits. So how many total combination we can have for eight bits? Two to the power eight, which is two fifty six. Two fifty six different uh, numbers, right? What what if you have sixteen bits? Again, in this course, I'm gonna focus on eight bits and sixteen bits. Because we're going to use it all the time. In case of 16 bits, guys, okay, so it should be 2 to the power 16. This is all the combination we have from 16 zeros, oops, from 16 zeros until 16 ones. All the combination we have from 16 zeros to 16 ones. Total, we have 2 to the power 16, which is 65,536. This is all the combination. We have. Is that okay? So for any n bit number, you can know how many combinations we have, right? Two to the power n. Any questions? This is the whole space. The whole, all the numbers I can have, all the numbers. Is that okay? Now, now, if this number is unsigned, if this number is unsigned, what is the minimum number and what is the maximum number? So the minimum number should be zero, the maximum number should be two to the power n minus one. It's still, what is the space? The whole space is still two to the power n. You get what I'm saying? So total, we have two to the power n. Starting from zero until two to the power n, not negative one, okay? For example, if you have three bits, three bits, three, three bits, that means I'm gonna start from zero, 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 which is zero, all the way until one, one, one. So one, 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 which is seven, which is two to the power three, negative one. Okay, guys? So that means, that means if you have n bit number, and I tell you this number is unsigned, it's easy to calculate that the minimum is zero, the maximum is two to the power n, negative one. Is that okay? And also it's easy to know the whole space. The whole space is because you have numbers from zero, zero, zero until one, 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 okay? So the whole space is two to the power n, right? So the last one should be two to the power n, negative one, because this is zero, right? So I'm gonna start from zero until two, two, two to the power n, negative one, right? Because the whole space is two to n, okay? However, if your number, if I tell you your number is signed, think about it. If, if I tell you your number is signed, now what, what I'm gonna do, I have a space. So half, almost half of the same numbers are gonna be in the positive area and half of the number are gonna be in the negative area, right? So if I tell you your number is signed, that means the minimum, the minimum number is negative two to the power n negative one, and the maximum should be positive two to the power n negative one, negative one. This, and if you look at the whole range, the whole range, the whole space is still two to n. Think about it. I didn't change. Still, you have the same space. Still, I have the same numbers. Okay. But what happened is that half of this, almost half, it's not exactly half. Because look here, 
This is negative one here. So the negative, the negative is one more than the positive. Okay. So let me give you an example. For example, if you have eight bits, just to clarify, eight bits. So it should be from negative 128 until positive 127. Almost half and half. The whole space, the whole space is 2 to 8. 2 to 8, which is 256. So I have 256 numbers. Half of this number I put in the positive area and half in the negative, almost half. Half and half, almost. Why it cannot be exactly half and half? Because we have zero in the, in the middle. We have zero in the middle, okay? That's why the negative almost one more, one more than the, the positive. Is that okay? This is, so, but here, here, so it should be from zero until two, two, two to the power eight, negative one, which is 255. Okay, guys? Conclusion, conclusion, before I move forward, conclusion. Number one, if you have any bit number, how many numbers, how many numbers, the whole space, how many numbers you can have? Two to the power n. This can give you all the different combination from zero, zero, zero until one, one, two to the power n, this number one. For any, for any n, whatever the value of n, this number. Number two, if I tell you this number is unsigned, so what is the minimum number and maximum number you can represent in, in, this, in this number? You can represent in this number. It's from zero until two to n negative five. And it's still the space is the same because it's the same space. But what happened here, because I don't have negative number, so it's gonna be, I'm gonna go fur, fur, further, further in the positive, positive area because I'm gonna use the whole space in the positive area, as you will see right now. So that's why here I can go from zero until 255. However, here I can go from negative 128 to positive 128. If you see how many numbers we have here, how many numbers we have here, both of them are the same, 256. Right? Anyway, so again, this is if I tell you your number is unsigned, you can know what is the minimum value and maximum value you can store in n bits. Same thing here for sign. Any questions? Again, we're going to focus on 8 bits and 16 bits. So, in case of 8 bits, so in case of unsigned, we can go from 0 until 2 to any negative 1, which is from 0 until 255. So, 0, 0, 0 is going to represent 0. One, 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 one is gonna represent 255. Okay, guys? But if I tell you this number is signed, so in case of signed, I can't go to until 255 because I'm gonna use the half of the space, half of the space or half of the numbers I'm gonna, I'm gonna use it for in the negative area. So here I can go from negative 128 to positive 127, okay? So negative is one more as you see. So now if we go for 16 bits, if we go for 16 bits, guys, okay? So again, in case of unsigned numbers, we can go from zero until two to 16, negative one, which 65, 536, okay? Still the whole space, the whole numbers we have, 65, 536, okay? Now, if it is signed, so I can go from negative 32, 7, 6, 8 to positive 32, 7, 6, 7. So again, always the negative is one more because I can't divide equally. I cannot divide the space equally because I have zero in the middle. So one of them should be one more. So here I make the negative or we make the negative one. Any questions? Easy. Okay, guys. So now the question is, how can you decide? How can you decide if you need byte or a word? So you want to measure something. I want to measure the speed. I want to measure the temperature. I want to measure something. Okay, how can I decide if I need a byte or I need a word? Pretty simple. Look, look at the range here. So, for example, in case of a byte, this is the range you have. You can have if your number is unsigned, you can go up to from zero to 255. Is this is okay for you? Okay, use byte. Number one, if what you are, what you are measuring, if it is unsigned, unsigned. Okay, if you if what you are measuring is less than 255. 255 or, or less, you can use a byte. If it is more, if you are measuring something and you are expecting it's gonna be more, okay, so you have to upgrade it. You have to use a word so that you can go to 65, 535. Because it's pretty simple, right? Same thing if your number is signed. So if your number is signed, 
Increase of sine, this is your limit from here to here. If you are expecting what you are measuring, it's going to be in this range. Okay, you survive. If you are expecting what you are measuring is more than that, okay, you have to do the work. The work is this is a range for a work. Okay, guys? Any questions? Yes, you have questions. So, again, this is something when you write your program, you need to decide are you going to use a byte or a word? Same thing, by the way, guys, use it in C language. You remember when you use integer, long integer, short integer, low, whatever. Okay, so we use integer or length integer, short integer based on what? Based on uh, the size. Okay, how big how big the number is? Same, 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 same. same thing here. Okay. Any questions? Okay. So now I'm gonna move to the next section. Next section here. I want to talk about computer hardware organization. So I want to tell you here. Okay, look here, guys. So in this section, I want to talk about any any computer uh, uh, architecture. Any, 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 any computer should have this architecture. Any computer should have this architecture. But first, first, let's agree. When I say computer, what do you mean by computer? What do you mean? Listen to me. When I say computer, I mean your laptop. Your laptop is a computer. Your PC is a computer. Smartphone is a computer. This is chip is a computer. This is chip is a computer. Let's agree on that, right? All of them have the same architecture. But, but maybe this one has more resources. Maybe this one has more, more, space, more memory than this one. Maybe the CPU is faster here than this one, okay? Which is not a bad thing. Why is not a bad thing? Because as I'm gonna explain later, I'm not gonna use this chip. I'm not gonna use this chip to, uh, to run MATLAB. I'm not gonna use it to run like a Word or Windows. No, I'm not gonna do that, okay? I'm gonna use this chip to make a system. Like for example, a traffic signal, to control a traffic signal, as, as I'm gonna explain later. So maybe this one has limited resources, but it's okay, because I'm not, that's what I need for, for the system I'm gonna use here. That's what I'm saying. But all of them should have the same architecture, okay? Or the same basic architecture. So let's see here. So any computer system should have this architecture. Number one, we should have processor or sometimes we call it microprocessor or CPU, whatever you want to call it, CPU. So I'm gonna, and then we have number of input output devices, okay? And also we have memory, we have memory. Also, we have what we call buses, buses. So, okay, you, you are telling me any computer system should have a CPU. Okay, CPU alone can create a system or can create a computer, no. CPU alone cannot work, okay? CPU, in order to create a system or create a computer, okay, or computer uh, system, you should have memory. I'm gonna tell you why I need to have memory here. In, in addition to the CPU, I need memory. Also, I need input output devices, okay? For example, here, as I'm gonna explain later, we have here several input output devices. So again, now I'm gonna talk about one by one in some details, okay? So this is the main idea quickly before, before I elaborate, okay? So we have here what we call input device. Look at the direction of the arrow. This one is called output device. Look at the direction of the arrow. It means something, it means something. Right? So here, that means the data always come from here to here. This one means the data always come from here to here. This one means the data can come this way or it can come this way. You can understand what I'm saying? So that means all the time CPU is gonna read from the input devices, not gonna write, it's gonna read. So the data is gonna flow, the data is gonna flow from this device to, to the CPU, right? If it is input, if it is output, See, that is gonna flow from here to the output, okay? Let me give you an example. What do you mean? I don't understand. I'm gonna tell you what I mean. The LCD, LCD here. Do you think, do you think 
the CPU is going to read data from the LCD, it's going to write data to the LCD. It has to write to the LCD. So the LCD is output device, output, because it's just like CPU can write to the LCD. Same thing for the signal signal, signal signal here. Does it make sense? I'm going to read something from the signal segment or signal segment, I'm going to write to the signal segment. Okay, you understand what I'm saying? So this is output device, LEDs. We have here eight LEDs. So all of this microprocessor is going to write to this device. So this should be output device. Okay. Some, some devices like a switch is here, a switch. So now CPU is going to read the data from the switch. You have a sensor, you have a key bed. Okay. So all of these devices are input device. And again, very simple. Any device, a microprocessor is going to read from a device, this device is input, right? If microprocessor is going to write to a device, so this device should be output. Okay, guys? So input device should be used to send the data to the microprocessor. Output device should be used so that the microprocessor can send the data to this device. Okay? For example, as you will see in this code, I, I measured the temperature, okay? And I want to display it here. Output, so because I want to display it to the user, so I'm going to write it here, or I'm going to write it in the signal segment here. Is that okay? But now for memory, look at the arrow here for memory. Yeah, because now the situation is different. For memory, I can write or I can read. That's why it's by direction that you see here. So my microprocessor can write or I can read. So I'm going to elaborate about this, okay? But for input, it's only one way. Output should be one way, okay? Now, also we have something we call bus, bus. So what buses means, okay? And how it is used. I'm gonna give you more details, but the idea is that we don't have one input. We have a number of input devices. We have a number of output devices, okay? How all of them can communicate with the CPU. So I'm gonna tell you here, uh, elaborate a little bit here, okay, so. So just briefly before I elaborate briefly, the CPU, the buses, should enable the input output and memory to communicate with the processor in a very efficient way. I'm gonna elaborate what this means. Okay. So I'm gonna take one one by one here and, and explain it a little bit. Mm. Okay, how this one? Sorry, which one? This one? Yeah. It's already here. But it's, it's shown on the other, it's shown on the screen here because it's extended. You got what I'm saying? Okay, no, I'm not maximizing it. I already maximized it, but show, it sh it's shown here, not here. You got what I'm saying? So what I'm trying to do here should be here using this one. I want to say it should come here, not here. Okay. Yeah, okay, working. Okay. Anyway, look guys, what, I'm, what I want to see here. Guys. What I want to say, we have microprocessor. Uh, the, way, the way the system works is the way the system works is all the time. Data is going backward, backward and forth between microprocessor and input output device. If you see how the system works all the time, data is going to go this way or data coming this way. So you're exchanging data all the time between the CPU and input output device. Okay? So the way we connect them together using buses. So I'm going to tell you what I mean by bus. Bus, bus means it's common bus, common wires. So we have some wires. These wires are common, okay? Common wires, okay? The way it works is, if this input, input device wanna send the data to the microprocessor, it has to put this data on the bus, and the microprocessor can, can read it from the bus. You got what I'm saying? So why, why is it made it this way? I'm gonna tell you why is it made it this way, because if you have like microprocessor, I cannot, I can, I cannot create like dedicated, dedicated connection for every input output device. It's this not efficient to do this way, okay? Or it's not even scalable to connect it dedicated between, dedicated for, uh, connection between every CPU and every input output device. It, it, they don't do this way. The way you, they do it, 
we have here common bus, common bus. Okay, you want to send it a put it in the bus, and then I'm going to get it from the bus. You, if I want to get it from put it in the bus, and then I'm going to get it from the bus. That's how it works. That's why if you see here, guys, we have here, for example, input, input, input device one. This input device one should put data on the bus, and then make so it can get it from the bus. So this bus is accessible, is accessible by all the devices, okay? For sure, by common sense, only one device should use a bus, the bus at the same time, right? It's, it's, two devices should not write at the same time, otherwise it's not gonna work, right? So only at a certain time, so it should, should be only one device is using the bus, okay? So bus, you can think of the bus is just a wire, it's just a wire. And this is a, an approach to enable the CPU to exchange data with the input output devices. You got what I'm saying? Uh, so we have three types of buses. We have data bus, we have address bus, we have control bus, okay? We classify them based, based on the data they carry, okay? So for example, the data bus, they should carry data, data, okay? What data, as you will see later, when I read when I read the number for you here, this is data, so, okay? When, if I want to display a number here on the city segment, this is a data. If I want to display a number here, it's a data, okay? So anyway, so for example, if, if the microprocessor wanna, wanna send this number 17 to the output device, so microprocessor has to put on the shared bus 17, right? And then, uh, and then, so here this is shared bus, as I told you, this shared bus is, is accessible by all devices, okay? Assuming this is output device one, output device is two, and so on, okay? Assume the microprocessor when I send number 17 to this guy, to this guy, how it works. Number one, microprocessor has to put number 17 on the data bus, this number one. Is that okay? Is that enough? No, it's not enough. Why? Because everybody can get 17. This 17 is accessible to everybody. So I have to tell, I have to tell who should take this data. You got what I'm saying? Because this is shared, shared to bus, right? So number one, I'm gonna put 17 on the bus so everybody can get the 17. But I need to send the 17 for a specific device. Here comes the address bus, okay? So we have another one we call address bus. So the, the address bus, the idea for the address bus is every input or output device should have a unique identifier number, like your social security number. Every Every, every person here in the United States have, have a unique number, identifier. Same thing here, every, we call it address, okay? For example, this, this, this output device number two, okay? For example, it has address number two and this one has address number one, for example. So here, if I, if I want this information 17 to go to, to go to output device number two, so in the address bus, I'm gonna put two. That means I'm saying, the information or the data on the data bus, it has to be taken, it has to be uh, to, uh, it, it is addressed to the device number two. Okay. So number two is gonna take it. What about the other devices? They are not gonna, because this is not the numbers, they are not gonna take it. You understand what the idea of work is? So let me say it again. Every, number one, you should understand the idea of share, share to bus. Then all of us, we can access the same information, right? However, I have to decide. I want to send the data. I have to tell your data. You want to send it to the LCD or you want to send it to the second segment? You want to send it to the LEDs? You want to send it to the buzzer? Every one of them has a different address, different number. You got what I'm saying? That's why if I want to send a number to the buzzer or to the uh, second segment, I have, I have also to use the address bus. Okay, so I'm gonna use the address of this device and then I put the number. Automatically, the device is gonna take it. It's a, the device that has this address is gonna take this number. Yes. What about that? Okay. Where you store, where you have both data stored on the Like hard drive or something like that? So you have like, uh, so if you have two separate hard drives, Look, it's it's exactly the same idea. If you, if you go down to the physical physical representation of the data, there are locations. Every location has a unique address. Okay, but the way they do it, 
they automatically store the data in two different lo space locations, yeah, uh, two different hard drives. So that in if one fails, okay, so this is like I want to say it's a higher level than here. I'm talking about the low level, right? It's the level of the hardware, right? But what you are saying is something like in the higher level. So if you have different, uh, even the same thing for the hard drive, uh, hard for the hard drive, uh, 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 right? Uh, they have location. Every location should have a unique identifier number. You get what I'm saying? So it's almost the same idea. But here, what you are saying here, because redundancy, I want to store the data to uh, two different uh, drivers. So this is something like it can be done at higher level, right? Yeah. So, so that's why when I teach in chapter three, chapter three, uh, you will understand better. In chapter three, chapter three, I'm going to tell you every input output device has a number, unique number. You understand what I'm saying? So now, now I want you to understand how everything works. Okay, so the idea is, yeah, I think I have. So here, as as you, as you see here, guys, you have here data bus, you have address bus, right? The the address bus should tell who should get this data, who should get get, get this data. Okay, so for example, if I want to send number seventeen to the output device number one. So I have to put here 17, but in the address bus, I have to put one here in the address bus to tell this data has to go to number one. Okay, identify number one. Okay. Otherwise, how it works? Otherwise, how it works? All of us are, are connected with the data bus. I have to tell who should take this data. That's why, as I told you in chapter three, if you want to send the data to the seven segment, you have to use the address of the seven segment. If you want data to this one, you have to use the address of this one. Okay, so every every input output every input output device has a unique address. Is that okay? What about memory? As I can explain right now, memory it has too many locations. Every location can store only one byte. Every location also has a unique address. You got the same idea. Otherwise, how 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 it would work? Because we have too many locations. If I want to store data, you have to tell me where exactly in which location I have to store it. Okay. So I'm going to elaborate just shortly, just in, yeah. Yeah. So that's what I'm going to explain right now. So for memory, as you see here, this is just a di diagram for memory. As you see here, memory should have too many locations, as you see here, guys. Okay. Every location you can, it can, can store only one byte in every location. It cannot be more, it cannot be less. It's about one unit. Fix it unit. This location, take a byte. This location, give me a byte, right? You can only read a byte or every location can store a byte, okay? So every location should have address, a number, right? So, so for example, if I wanna read the information at location number two, you have to give me the address, right? You have to tell me which, I can't tell the memory read or write. I can't, I can't do that, right? You have to tell me if you wanna read which location. That's what we call address. So the memory here, we have locations. Every location has a unique address and every location will store a byte, okay? So for example, if I want to write to this location, I have, I have to put zero on the address bus. Address bus, I have to put zero on the address bus to tell the, the location number zero, I want to write to you. Then whatever write, it's going to come here. It's going to replace this one. Anyway, if I want to read location number two, I have to, just I want you to understand, what is the difference between why I need address bus and what why I need data bus, right? So, for example, if I want to read from the memory, location number two, number one, I have to put I have to put number two, I have to write number two on the address bus. Number two, I'm gonna tell the memory read. Once I do that, the memory is gonna look at the address bus. Yeah, you wanna read number two? Okay, so it's gonna take this one, it's gonna put it on the data bus. Then Microsoft is going to take it from the data bus. Okay. Anyway, so it's the same idea here, guys. If I want to write, if I want to, if I want to write to this output, uh, output, uh, 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 output device number two. Uh, okay, uh, number two. So I have to put here number two. This is the address on the address bus. I have to put here number seventeen because I I want to write number seventeen. I want to send. I want to write number seventeen to this output device. Okay. Once, once you put the data and once you put the address, is that done? Okay, so the device is gonna work? No, you have, you have, to, you have to send a command to the device. You have to send a command. 
You have to think that the device, now the data, the data bus is ready. The trace bus is ready. Start to work. You have to give the command, okay? So how I can give the command, that's what we call control bus. So, so three buses, they have to work together. So let me, let me tell you how it works. Look here, guys. If the microprocessor wanna write number 17 to the device number two, how it works? Three steps. Number one, I have to put 17 on the data bus. This number one. Number two, I have to write number two in the address bus. Is that right? Okay. Number three, now everything is ready. So I'm gonna tell, I have to, I have to send a command to the device using the control bus. Once I do that, once I send the command, the device is gonna take whatever here on the data bus, which is 17, and is gonna, uh, which device, because all of them are accessible, which device? The device that has this address, okay, number two. Okay, it's gonna take this one and it's gonna store it. So this one is not gonna take this data because yeah, this is not for me. The address, this address is not for me, is that okay? So you should understand now, what I'm saying, we have three shared, shared buses, shared, right? So one for data, one for addresses, one for control, okay? Data, data bus is used to share data. If I wanna send the data to you, I'm gonna put it in the bus and then you can take it from the bus. If you wanna send the data to me, put it in the bus and then I'm gonna take it from the bus, okay? Address is used to tell who should, who should read or write. So who, 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 which, which input output device or which memory location, okay? Number three, the control bus should give the command to the memory. Memory, everything is ready. You have to start reading right now. You have to start writing, okay? Very well. So now, so microprocessor sent his data to the memory or, in, or output devices. However, microprocessor, and this is, we call it write. Microprocessor is gonna write to the memory. Microprocessor, when it takes data from the memory or input output device, we call it to you read from the input output device, okay? So now let me let me go a little bit here, guys. So I told you any computer system. Okay. So now I told you any computer system should have microprocessor. Uh, I'm gonna elaborate a little bit about this microprocessor. Also, I told you about we have input devices, we have output devices, also we have memory, right? And we have buses. This buses should enable it's changing the data. And this is if you look at how the system works all the time. Send the data, receive data, send the data, receive data, all the time, microprocessor, sending data, receiving data, sending data, receiving, uh, okay? So that's how it is all the time, okay? It's exchanging data with, with the input, output device and, and memory. So now, now I wanna focus more on memory. So for sure, input, output device is easy, right? Because it, I, wanna, I wanna display something here. So this is output device, so I'm gonna send something with the MCU, right? Now I wanna, I wanna get some value from the user. So I'm gonna read it from the switch. So you can input some value in the switches, then I'm gonna read the switch, it makes sense. But now you are telling me every system should have a memory, right? So tell me why I need a memory, why we need a memory, okay? And how it works. So now I wanna focus more on memory. So the question is, why, why I need a memory? I need a memory guys because as, as, as you will understand better in this course, in memory, I store two things in memory. I in, in the memory, I store two things. Number one, I store data. And what I mean by data, for example, you know, any, any program, you, you, sh you should have variables, you should have arrays, okay? You should have a string, a string or text, right? All, all of this, what, what, that's what I mean by, by data, right? So all your variable are arrays, uh, text, Message, messages should be or data, right? So they are stored, they are stored in, in, in memory, okay? Also, your program is stored here. And that's what you see, you are gonna see in the first slide. In the first slide, you are gonna write the program in assembly, and then you are gonna see how this program is converted to machine code and to stored in memory. Okay, uh, can you say it again? Okay, I'm gonna say it again. Look here, guys. What program means? Any program is just a bunch of instructions. Is that right? So any program, any language, just a bunch, bunch of instructions, okay? What happens is that after you write your program, this bunch of instructions should be converted to machine code, okay? 
this is the only thing that uh, microprocessor can execute. Microprocessor doesn't understand your Java or 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 while loops, uh, for loops. This is just for you. Microsoft doesn't understand that, okay? So that's what you're gonna understand better in this course, right? So any every microprocessor should come with a bunch of instruction. It, it can be execute, executed by the hardware, right? So whatever language you are using, at the end, you have to use some programs like assembler, uh, compiler, compiler to convert your, your program to ma machine code, right? So again, any any program is just a bunch of instruction. Every instruction, just a bunch of ones and zeros. Is that okay? So your program, where, where your program is stored? Microprocessor doesn't have a storage area. So microprocessor here, microprocessor doesn't have a storage area, right? So what happens as you, as you will see in the as you will see in the in the coming lab is your program should be stored in memory. Again, your program is a bunch of instructions. Every instruction is just a bunch of points and zeros. That was what I'm saying. And then when my when the microprocessor executes the program, how, how microprocessor is gonna execute the program? Microprocessor is gonna come in the memory. Memory, give me an instruction one. Then after you read instruction one, punch one to zero, you are gonna execute it by the hardware. When you finish instruction one, you are gonna go to the memory back. Memory, give me instruction two. You are gonna read it from, from, from the memory, execute it. Memory gives me an instruction three and so on. Is that picture now is clear? You will see, you will understand better in the coming lab. So let me say it again. Uh, I need memory. Any system should have memory, okay? Because the memory should store your program in machine code, right? Because processor doesn't have a storage area to store the program. All what I have to do uh, to execute an instruction by instruction, I'm gonna read instruction by instruction from the memory. Right, give me one instruction, bunch of ones and zeros, execute it. So I'm, I finish an instruction number one, give me an instruction number two, and so on. You got them, sir? Anyway, so here I want to show you how it is connected. How so, all the time, all the time, um, microprocessor and memory they are exchanging data. I want to read this location, I want to write to this location, I want to read this location, I want to write to this location, all the time. How this is done. It is done, done by this way. Memory, you can see it like a memory chip. You have a chip here, chip. And this chip should be wired, wired to the microprocessor this way. Okay, as I told you, we have data bus. Okay, we have address bus. Look at the direction of the address bus. In the address bus, you have to tell me memory. And then also you have here control bus, read or write. For sure. You have to tell me as a memory, you want to read or you want to write. So, so that's why you have control here. You have to tell me you want to read or write. Also, if you want to read or write, you have to tell me which location because I have too many locations. You cannot just tell me read. You can because I have too many locations. So you have to tell me which location, right? Um, that's how it is. It is connected. Okay. So in our in our in our uh, microcontroller here, the data bus is eight bits. That means when I read in every reading operation, I can read eight bits or I can write eight bits. Okay. Because as I told you, this is how, how it is made. In memory, is a memory, we have locations. Location number zero, location number one, location number two, location number three. But I'm not going to call it location anymore. I'm going to call it address. Okay. So we have to tell me which address you want to read, which address you want to write to. Okay. Anyway. And every location or any address, we store one byte, fixed size, one byte. Is that okay? So for example, if I tell the memory, I want to read the location number two, memory is going to give you A, B. Okay? If I want to write to the location number one, I want to write to location number one, F, F. So what happens, this one is going to be deleted. You are going to overwrite. You are going to delete whatever is there, and then you are going to write F, F. Okay? So, so now you should understand what I mean by address. Address is a unique identifier. Address is a unique identifier. This unique identifier, it can be for input output devices, also for locations in memory. Same thing for locations in memory. Uh, I told you, we have a fixed unit. We have fixed unit. When you store in memory, you can store a byte or you read a byte, okay? So now someone can ask me, what if my data is less than a byte? Assume, assume my data is one bit, for example. 
for some, for I have one bit, this bit can be zero or one. Zero means something, one means something else, okay? So how you can store it in a memory? Can you store it in memory? One bit? No, you can't. As I told you, very, very clear. You you have to write a byte, you have to read a byte, okay? So how, how can you do it? Very simple. The way you can do it, guys, you can have a byte this way. You can put your information, if it is one bit or two bits, whatever, and then you can put zeros here, and then you can write the byte. You understand what I'm saying? So you have a byte here, okay? And my, for example, my data is just one bit or two bits. Okay, so I'm gonna put here in this bit in the byte. Then I'm gonna store a byte. Then when I read the byte, I'm gonna only look at this bit. Okay, because I can only write a byte or read a byte. Okay, so this is my answer. If your data is less than a byte, so now what if your data is greater than a byte? Think about it. For example. My data is a word or double word, okay? How I can do it? You understand what I'm saying? What I'm saying, every location in the memory is stored in one byte. What if my data is 16 bits? And 16, 16 bits is a, is a velocity, it is a temperature, something you are measuring, right? So it's a word. How I can store it? Very simple. The way you are gonna do it, guys, you are gonna store it in two locations. Two locations, right? Because every location is a byte. For example, as you see here, guys, this is a word, for example, here. We have a byte here, least significant byte and most significant byte, okay? What, are, what we are gonna do here, here in this course, guys, look here, guys. If I take the memory, I have a byte and I wanna store it in location 1000. Okay, so what the memory is gonna do, is gonna go to the location 1000 and it's gonna put the byte here in this, in this location. Okay, this location is a byte. Uh, if this, this location is a byte and you want to store a byte, okay, we don't have a problem, we're okay. However, if you have a word here, as, as we will do in this course, you have a word, I'm going to say, I want to store this word in location 1000. Actually, we say it this way, okay? But that doesn't make sense because location 1000 is a byte. So how can you store word in a byte? Okay, look here, guys. Actually, when I say, I want to store a word in 1000. What's going to happen is automatically it's going to take 1000 and next one, 1001. But I don't need to say 1000 and 1001. You just give me one address. And because this is a word, I'm going to put it in two locations. You understand what I'm saying? So again, in this course, guys, as you will see later, you can say, I want to store a byte in 1000. What happens? I'm going to store this byte only in one location. However, if I say, I want to store a word in location 1000 because this is a word. So automatically it's, it's going to take 1000 and next one. So this word, I'm going to put it here in two, in two locations. I don't need to say, I don't need to say 1000 and 1001. I don't need, I don't need to say 3000 and 3001 because it's automatically just to give me one. And then I'm going to put it also in the next one. Yes. Yes, you overwrite it. You can say whatever it is. It's a very good question, right? Very good question. Look here, guys. If I have a location, if I have a memory location here, for example, this one has seven F. If you read, if you read, okay, read, you are not going to change it. Still seven F. If you read, you copy, you copy. So I'm not going to change it. However, if we have some value here like seven F, and you write, if you write A B, you actually overwrite. So this one is gonna be canceled of EB. You overwrite. Yes, you have a question? Yeah, so whatever you're saying, read out of that, if you're looking for that byte, or if you're looking for the word, you just have to read the 1,000. Yes. So what I'm saying, what I'm saying is guys, what I'm saying, let me say it again. If I have a byte and I take the memory, please store this byte in 1,000. Okay, you're gonna take this byte, put it in 1,000, right? If I have a word and I, I tell, I, when I write an instruction, I say, I say, I want to store this word in 1000. So I mean 1000 and 1001 automatically, but I do need to say, I do need to write an instruction. 1000 and 1001, no, just give me 1000, but this word, I'm going to put it in two loops. And this makes sense because a word is 16 bit. Every location is a byte. So I can to store two bytes in, in one byte. You know what I'm saying? So, but the way just to make it easy, as you will see later in this course, when I, when I say I want to store a word in 1000, automatically it's going to take this one and next one, okay? Uh, and the order, 
So now, for example, as you see here, guys, this is a wall. We have least significant byte and we have most significant byte, okay? And then I'm gonna say, I wanna store it in 1000. Okay, that means 1000 and 1001. Okay, so what about the order? So now I have two bytes and I have two locations. I have two bytes and I have two locations, okay? Should I store this one in 1000 and this one in 1001 or this one or this one in 1000 and this one 1001? What about the order, okay? Actually, look here, guys. It doesn't matter as long as when you read or write, it's the same order. When I write a word, I'm going to get the, word, the same word again, right? However, for so for our microcontroller, the way you are going to do it is when I say I have this word, this is byte X, byte Y. When I say I want to store it in 1000, so it's going to be 1000 and 1001. So what happens, the least significant byte is going to be stored at 1000, and the most significant byte is going to be stored at 1001. You understand what I'm saying? So if I write a number in a certain way and read it in the same way, so I'm going to get the same number. Okay, what you mean is not clear. Okay, I'm going to tell you what I mean. Look here. For example, for example, look here, guys. I have this byte, 3AF2. Okay, this is, this is a word, right? I want to store it 3A in 1000, and then 1001, I'm going to store F2 when I store it, okay? When I read, I'm going to read it in the same order. So when I read it, I'm going to get 3A here and F2 here. Makes sense, right? Otherwise, when you write a number and you read it, you are going to get a different number. Doesn't make sense, right? So, so when I write, when I write this number this way, I'm going to put it in this order, right? The the least significant byte is going to be stored first, and then the most significant byte is going to be stored in this order. You understand what I'm saying? When I read the, the first one, I'm going to read it the least significant, and the second one is going to be the most significant. So that when I read. When I, I write a number, I'm going to get the same number again when I read it. You understand what I'm saying? Anyway, this is how it works here in our microcontroller. Uh, by the way, other microcontrollers do the opposite. So, so other microcontrollers, they store the most significant first and the least significant second. So here, you work with F2 and 3A. Actually, it doesn't matter as long as the way you, you read, right, the same way you, you, you read, it doesn't matter because when I write a number, when I read it, I have to get the same number. Okay? But anyway, I don't confuse you, but for our microcontroller, as you would see in this course, we store we store the least significant first and then the most significant second, okay? Uh, one more thing here, I, I forgot to tell you guys here. We have, we have addresses, right? We have data. We agreed that the data is eight bits, okay? So every time, if, uh, so here, so for example, if you have three A, F two, if this is a word, so I have to, I have to, I have, to, it has to, it has to be done twice. So I have to write, I have to write this one at location one thousand, and then I have to write this one at location one thousand one, right? Because every time you can only send a byte, so I have to do it twice, byte and then a byte. Okay, not not you. Uh, what I mean, you don't need to go this details. I'm, I'm saying. You just use an instruction, but when this instruction is executed, the instruction is going to do this way. But you just, as you see, as you will see later in the assembly, you just you just write a word. I'm explaining how it works, okay? Uh, but you just write a word, okay? Uh, but the way it works, you, you write a byte and then you write another byte. Now, for the addresses, how many addresses, how big is the ad ad addresses here? How many addresses we have? Let's agree on this. For data, our data is eight bits. So that means in one reading or one writing operation, I can only read or write eight bits, right? So if you want to write a word or read a word, I have I have to, to do it twice, okay? But again, you are not going to write two instructions. No, it's one instruction, but this instruction is going to do it twice, okay? Anyway, for addresses, how big is the addresses we have? Okay, for addresses, we have 16-bit addresses. So any address can be, re so let me, because this little bit confuses students. So this is the memory guys. Ooh. Yeah, this is the memory. I told you for memory, we have addresses and we have data here. The data here is bytes. So every location is storing byte. Every location is storing byte. The addresses, how big is the addresses? How big? The addresses we have 16 bit. 16, 16. That means that means 
we have starting from address zero, 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 zero hexadecimal, this 16 bits, by the way, until the address F, 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 F. Okay, 16 bit. We have from zero, zero, zero until F, F, F. Hexadecimal. If you want to think about it binary, should be 16, zero. Because every, every, this is percent, every four bit here is only one bit here, okay? So if, if this binary 16 zeros until 16 ones. That's why I like, I like hexadecimal more. Instead of writing 16 zero, 16 one, I can just write four zeros and four ones. Okay, but so anyway, what I'm saying is that addresses are 16 bits. That means we have addresses, we have, Starting from zero 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 until until f f f. This is all the locations we have. Okay. Okay, guys. Okay. Uh, okay. So that's enough for today. So we're gonna have uh, tomorrow. We're gonna have a, a lecture in a set of lab. Okay. We're gonna have lecture. It's gonna be in Johnson Johnson Hall, not here. Okay. The reason I want to give a lecture because I have to start with the first lab uh, next week. So I have to teach a lot of stuff to start the first step.